Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alexis Conley and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at Bridgewater State University. Um, I am thr thrilled to welcome you to our March alumni, Unrecognized and Still Swinging, Women's Athletics, 1890s through 1972 with Dr. Orson Kingsley. Orson just got his doctorate recently, so I wanna make sure I get the doctor in there, that's important. Um, it's a beautiful sunny day out and I appreciate you guys being with us today. And before we get things started, as always, just a few quick housekeeping items to enhance your viewing. First, this alumni will be recorded for future use. <clears throat> as such, it will be available on our website for future watching. Our goal is to have it posted within the next few days. I would also like to call your attention to the top right corner of your screen where you will find the view option. We suggest the speaker view for optimal viewing. We kindly ask all participants to please have their video off and sound muted as to not take away from the presentation. <coughs> oh, I'm very sorry, I have a little scratch. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer period. Questions can be typed in at any time throughout the talk using the chat feature in the middle of your bottom toolbar. These questions will be compiled by our moderator. <coughs> <laughs> like Alexis, I've had a cold for 10 days, so hopefully I don't start going into a coffin fit too. <laughs> I apologize, I've never had this happen. Um, please bear with me. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer period. Questions can be typed in at any time throughout the talk using the chat feature in the middle of your bottom toolbar. These questions will be compiled by our moderator and asked at the end. If the question and answer period runs longer than you are able to remain online, we will continue until all questions are answered and you will be able to watch the responses in the recording. Most of all, we want you to have a great experience and learn something new from Orson. Dr. Orson Kingsley has been the head of archives and special collections at BSU's Maxwell Library since 2011. During this time, he has helped increase the amount and the range of archival collections held by BSU, as well as heightened awareness and usage of the archival collections by students, faculty, and researchers on a local, regional, and national level. He has a PhD in humanities from Salva Regina University and takes an interdisciplinary approach in his own research and when teaching students how to utilize archival resources. Take it away, Orson. Okay, thank you. So. <laughs> Share my screen. Okay, I think we're good to go. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'm going to be talking about the exhibit that is currently up and I'm gonna do the best I can to try to uh, replicate the uh, exhibit experience through a virtual environment. I hope it goes well. So we'll see how that how it turns out. But um, I want to begin with uh, stating that the whole inspiration of this exhibit was not only based on recent donations of collections, which, which I'll get into, but also 2022 is the 50th anniversary of the title 1972 Title IX ruling. And that was a very important uh, piece of legislation. And I do want to give just a little bit of background on Title IX so it'll help put this exhibit in context. But uh, Title IX states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The single biggest intended consequence of Title IX was explosive increases in girls' and women's participation in high school and collegiate athletics. In 1972, approximately one in 25 high school girls played sports. Today, that number is one in four. Girls and women's teams were added across the nation. Girls and women's athletics, although they had a long history of participation, competition, and skill were finally funded by the institutions and treated with the respect that they so deserve. 
Despite this, half a century after the landmark 1972 ruling, the fight for equality is still ongoing. And this exhibit focuses on women in athletics pre-Title IX, pre-1972. So a little bit of the exhibit background outside of Title IX. Um, the past few years, I've been working with a couple of um, women in town, Kathleen Bertrand, Kathy, and Linda London. And they have spent decades acquiring this phenomenal women in sports collection, memorabilia, including archives, artifacts, um, ephemera items, all sorts of content. And their inspiration for doing this has largely been to, in their own way, um, capturing a lot of material that predates Title IX with the realization that a lot of the history of women in sports has been not only passed over, but largely forgotten. So um, their motive, and they have been uh, doing a lot of work with this collection in uh, bringing it to events, um, even like sport card shows, stuff like that, to promote it. And uh, Kathy is a BSU 1970 graduate. And one of their uh, inspirations in one of their mentors was Mary Pratt, a longstanding physical education professor in the Quincy, Massachusetts school system. And I'll get more into Mary later because she's a big part of this exhibit. And um, she was one of the uh, original 1943 Rockford Peaches from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, made famous in more recent times by uh, 1990, the 1992 movie, A League of Their Own, starring uh, Tom Hanks, Madonna, Gina Davis, whole star-studded cast. And um, Mary Pratt passed away a couple of years ago and she was the last living member of the original 1943 Rockford Peaches team. And I got to interview, interview her in I think 2018 and uh, it was quite entertaining. She had quite the personality. <laughs> So um, back to Kathy and Linda. So they have donated their collection to the Maxwell Library Archives and Special Collections Department that I run. And it's a, a very, very large and diverse collection. So um, as I've been working on this collection, acquiring it chunk by chunk over a couple of years, uh, I started coming up with the realization that um, Okay, uh, 2022 is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I'm getting this phenomenal women in sports collection, athletic collection donated. How can I think about increasing the awareness of the collection? Um, and then that's kind of when I came up with a potential idea for an exhibit on the 50th anniversary of Title IX because it all kind of came together. And originally I had intended to do an exhibit earlier, but COVID kind of got in the way and uh, shut everything down, so to speak even though the library never closed for a, about a year and a half span. So um, eventually uh, students returned, classes came back on campus starting fall 2021. 20, uh, and that's when I really started moving on doing the prep work for a potential exhibit. I had been researching some of the aspects of it for a year or two in advance, but finally when I got the go ahead that it could potentially happen, that's when I really jumped into it and started thinking of potential exhibit themes. Um, and you notice the flyer on the screen, that is one programming event that we did last month um, with a couple of my uh, faculty friends, Dr. Sarah Wiggins of the history department and Dr. Moore Rosenthal of health and kinesi kinesiology. Um, and the whole event was on freedom to move, the history and evolution of fashion women's athletics from 1800s to today. Quite entertaining. And I don't have any pictures of it here, but I got Maura to wear a replica all American girls uniform from, uh, if you've seen the movie, League of Their Own, one of those uniforms, quite entertaining. But when I was thinking about the exhibit, I was kind of thinking of a couple, a number of different directions to go, but really I not only wanted to highlight and showcase this amazing new collection we were getting donated, but also connect it to Bridgewater State's own past, because we have a very long and successful uh, athletic history um, program here, or, athletic program that goes back to the 1800s. And it's, um, we got a lot of material in the archives that already represent that, as well as a number of collections that already 
represent that theme of uh, athletic history, women's athletic history, I should say. And when I was putting this exhibit together, I was also really trying to hit themes that are still in the news today, which you'll see on the bottom of the slide listed. Um, a lot of the uh, information in the exhibit is represented from the 1890s to mainly the 1950s and 60s. And a lot of the controversial themes I was finding, especially in the 1920s and 30s, in the 1890s as well, they're still controversial issues to this day. So um, Title IX has done an amazing, great job of increasing equality and opportunity, but there's still a long ways to go. So I was trying to um, articulate that in the exhibit and hopefully I did. So this is our main panel. Flip through my notes here. I'll give you a second to read that before I move on. Um, and the overall main theme I was really trying to shoot for was, uh, you can guess it based on the title here, is um, giving recognition to a lot of these famous athlete, women athletes of the past and their causes uh, that have just been forgotten over time. And I should point out, state that I've been a sports fanatic since I was like eight years old, reading anything I could on sports history, men and women sports history. And one exciting part about this collection is so much of it is represented or is, um, consists of these very, at the time, famous women athletes that have just been borderline erased from history. So when I was doing research for this exhibit, I was finding all these amazing women represented in the collection. And I was shocked that I had never heard of them before. Um, the few of them I have, like Babe Diedrichsen, but uh, a lot of them, they were winning like gold medals left and right at Olympics and very, very famous back in the day. And I had never heard of them at all, which shocked me. So that's, these are the women I tried to focus on to, for portions of this exhibit. So we'll begin with Bloomer Girls. This is the first portion of the exhibit. And it's very hard to capture an exhibit through uh, photographs like this, but um, I'm gonna do my best here. So first, Bloomer Girls. The word Bloomer derives from a woman by the name of Amelia Jenks Bloomer, who wanted to create a more loose fitting clothing option for women to enable them to be more comfortable and move around more easily in their attire. In 1851, Amelia Bloomer began to wear a style of clothing that would become known as bloomers. Bloomers consisted of a loose fitting blouse, a knee length skirt and baggy pants. During this era, many women had to strap themselves into tight fitting corsets to attain the ideal society preferred figure. These corsets sometimes caused health problems and could even lead to physical deformities. On top of the corsets, women were to wear several layers of clothing, including petticoats and dresses. In the summer heat, the attire could be intolerably hot. It also made women's household duties difficult to perform. As a result, Amelia Bloomer actively encouraged women to forsake the style of dress for the cooler outfit that still bears her name. Although bloomers were not originally made for women playing baseball, they were very comfortable and allowed great mobility, so women who participated in baseball wore them so they could move around easier and more comfortably. The style became so prolific that over time, women playing baseball and bloomers came to be known as bloomer girls. The fashion would translate to other sports, women played, including basketball and casual swimming. And you see the uh, this fashion trend of bloomers right to about the mid, early to mid 1930s. So uh, it was a fashion trend for many, many decades and kind of revolutionized women athletics in that it really spearheaded the initial progress of uh, women to be able to move freely. That's the name of that programming event I did, the freedom to move. So um, this is an example here of a part of the collection that was donated that I found just fascinating. So as an archivist, when uh, we really get excited is when we get collections that we can't even find information on when we're uh, doing basic Google searches or anything like that, because that means they've probably never been researched, written about, and really exposed to the general public. So this uh, slide here is of Edith Dennison, a Boston Bloomer girl um, from the, about 1911 to 1917 is when she was uh, fairly, fairly famous. And 
this is actually a large photograph on the left there and also a scrapbook, which is represented for one page here. But as I was going through her scrapbook, it was just phenomenal what I was finding where she was just considered the best woman baseball player in the Northeast, dominant pitcher, and her statistics and win-loss record was just incredible. Um, and it was one amazing news clipping after another. If you do a Google search for her, you can't even find her name anywhere. Um, so it was kind of perplexing to me and uh, caused me to realize right off the bat, but when I was originally starting to plan this exhibit, like, okay, this is material that uh, needs to be a focus of the exhibit because um, if I can't find anything on it, that probably means most people aren't familiar with it at all. So researching the unknown is a passion for archivists like myself. And these are some other examples of uh, items I have in, this, in, the, in the display case on Bloomer Girls. Um, Maude Nelson on the left there, she was a professional baseball player, began in the late 1800s, early 1900s, also played for the Boston Bloomer Girls at one point. Um, and she was one of the early uh, baseball stars, again, that has been largely forgotten. This other photo here is of, the, of Brockton High School uh, women's basketball team from the late 20s. So it's interesting to see uh, this fashion trend span sports and also into uh, swimming attire too for women. So these are a couple old photographs from the early 1900s of uh, Bloomer Girl bathing suits. And um, I'm not sure of the location of these, but uh, this image here on the left is uh, similar to another item in the display, an actual real Bloomer Girl swimsuit from about 1920. And uh, if you look at this, especially if you're up close in person looking at the swimsuit, you start thinking, geez, if a woman were to jump in the water wearing that, how in the world could they possibly even swim without just sinking from the weight of it after it gets soaked with water? Uh, however, it was uh, quite fashionable for a couple decades, this style of uniform. And some of the material I have on the, in the physical exhibit, it was very difficult for me to get a decent photo, like this image on the right here. That is a pair of women's bloomers from the 1890s that we have in our, that we already had in our collection from one of our 1890s students named Alice Bowman. And uh, those are her little tiny gym shoes in a photo of her. And I got a closer view of those, but you can see that the bloomers are very wide and uh, loose fitting allowing freedom of movement much more easily than some of the uh, really uh, extravagant dresses and outfits that women had to traditionally wear. And these bloomers were owned by this woman here, Alice M. Bowman. She lived right up the road her entire life after she graduated uh, from Bridgewater State. I forget the name of the road, but it's a quarter mile of away from the campus. And her little tiny gym shoes are made of leather. She, she uh, wore these in gym classes when she was a student. And uh, I have uh, a couple other photos I'll show later in this presentation of where she's actually participating in athletics, probably wearing these same gym shoes. So the next portion we're getting into is um, one of the main themes of this exhibit, athletics and control over women's bodies. From the earliest images in part of this exhibit from the 1890s, women can be seen in fictitious outfits that show their bodies in hourglass shapes with tiny waistlines emphasizing their hips and breasts. Corsets, thick rigid body corsets, which are thick rigid body suits made of bone or plastic were required of women in the Victorian era to, era to appear suitable in public space. Women were thought to be weak and vulnerable and to maintain their health for their main duty of motherhood. So they had to be protected. Illness and deformity were side effects women had to endure to adhere to society's rules for women's appearance, even after dress reform and women had to had more freedom to wear bloomers. Men who had power in society were able to dictate how female athletes would be able to compete, to train, and to appear in public spaces. When women did not conform to makeup, long hair, and reserved behavior, there were penalties and consequences from the press, from peers, and from leaders in physical education and sport. 
Athletes who did not conform were often assumed to be lesbians and received criticism and less press attention. Women athletes who did conform and were not more traditionally beautiful received more and better press coverage. Female athletes in 2022 still face some of the same challenges in sport and society. In some venues, they are, they are expected to be feminine, not too muscular, strong but not too strong, and successful but not too successful. When female athletes are too bold, too strong, or challenge and beat men, they often face stigma and social penalties. And I should point in that uh, Dr. Maura Rosenthal helped me uh, with a lot of the uh, phrasing of um, some of the language of aspects of the exhibit, such as what I just read to you. Um, she's very, she has a phenomenal uh, background and knowledge of women in sports history. So uh, this whole exhibit was a bit of a collaborative effort, um, which was uh, made it much more fun to do. But um, as you can see from this slide, uh, you can see the, the fictitious nature of some of these cards, tobacco cards, compared to the reality. So the uh, four uh, lithographs that you, you can see, those are actually tobacco cards. They came in packs of cigarettes. Uh, obviously, you can probably guess the purpose why uh, to get men to buy cigarettes. And then you can see the reality of what women were actually wearing during the 1890s to play sports such as tennis. Very, very uncomfortable dresses with corsets uh, right up to their borderline chin, the collars of the dresses. Long sleeved. Um, you imagine trying to move playing any type of sport wearing those. Uh, very, very problematic. So you can see once uh, women started wearing bloomers, they never, they never turned back. <laughs> These are another example of um, products created by the tobacco industry to sell their product, to, to uh, entice buyers to purchase tobacco. These are actually silk pillowcases from about 1905. And uh, they're not realistic. Two women fencing in high heels in dresses with borderline no waistline. And these are supposed to represent Yale versus Harvard. But um, how these worked, if you bought enough packs of cigarettes and um, I don't know if there, I don't think there was a UPC codes on them, but uh, they had some type of gimmick where if you collected enough of these packets and mailed them into the tobacco companies, they would send you something like these silk pillowcases. And I have them framed on the wall in the exhibit and they're, the, the photograph really doesn't do it justice because they are very vibrant and just phenomenal. And they were never put into turned into pillows. They were just kept as a silk pillowcases. And these are highly collectible and very rare and unique these, these days. And on the right of the slide, you will see um, lithographs from 1908, similar in perspective, just very unrealistic women participating in multiple different sports, um, slightly less extreme than the 1890s material in the pillowcases on the left there, but still just not practical in any sense of the word. And another part of the exhibit focuses on some um, actual real life women. So you see here on the left, Sonia Henny, nicknamed the Pavlova of the Ice. She was a Norwegian figure skater, very petite and just one of the early athletic superstars of figure skating in the 1920s and early 1930s. And you can see she's in a uh, figure skating costume, very, very uh, formal. And then on the on the right here, you see Gertrude, I, I never know how to pronounce her last name, Adderley. Um, but she was the first woman to swing, swim the English Channel in 1926. And the photo of her in the middle, she is coated in grease because that was uh, what they did when for long distance swimming. And if you read anything about her, she is described as very muscular, borderline masculine and treated by the press completely different. When she was training to swim for the English Channel, even her first coach was pretty much telling her, women will never be able to swing, swim this distance. It's not possible for them physically. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating when you go back this far, I mean, nearly a hundred years ago, and you still see the same kind of language used by the press where uh, just, kind of almost vaguely 
criticizing women, but at the same time, if a woman was naturally beautiful, really using her image to sell newspapers and products and stuff like that. And uh, one of the uh, fascinating aspects of this is really seen in the 1940s and early 50s with the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, again, made famous in recent times uh, by A League of Their Own, the 19, early 1990s movie. But this is a listing here of um, rules and regulations from 1950 from players in this league. And one of them really stood out to me. And you can, I'll read the quote here. Always appear in feminine attire. This precludes the use of any wearing apparel of masculine nature, masculine, these are actually in capital letters in the document too, which is hard to read, masculine hairstyling, hairstyling, shoes, coats, shirts, socks, t-shirts are barred at all times. And this list also states that women cannot drink liquor in the league, league players cannot drink liquor. They have to abide by a curfew and essentially it states they are not allowed to talk with men. And I'll get more into the league in a bit. So where we really see this early transition of fashion and women's athletic um, apparel is with Suzanne Langland. And uh, she acquired the name, the French hussy from the British. But uh, Suzanne Langland, a French woman, was the first female international athletic superstar. She was ranked number one in the world in tennis from 1921 to 1926 and won six Wimbledon singles titles, including five in a row from 1919 to 1923. Lengling was a pioneer in breaking the mold of women's athletic fashion. Her methods of swapping out impractical and unsuitable women's clothing for playing tennis with more modern clothing that would allow her to move more freely was very, very controversial. At the same time she was doing that, at the same time she was doing this, she was setting global fashion trends that would become synonymous with the 1920s flapper age. Early in her career, Lengling had decided to remove her corset while playing tennis as it restricted her movement. This practical decision resulted in her, in her gaining the nickname from the British, the French Hussy. A description of her appearance in 1919 at Wimbledon is as follows. Suzanne acquired strength and pace of shot by playing with men and for playing a man's type of game, she needed freedom of movement. Off came the suspender belt and she supported her stockings by means of garters above the knee. Off came the petticoat and she wore only a short pleated skirt. Off came the long sleeves and she wore a neat short sleeved vest. Her first appearance at Wimbledon caused much, com much comment, but, with, but the success of her outfit led to its adoption by others. And here are some more uh, close-up examples of photos that are in the exhibit of uh, Suzanne. And you can see the, uh, the head wrap, the fur coat, the streamlined uniform, so to speak, compared to earlier uh, tennis outfits you really see this, her style being replicated in the jazz age of the 1920s, the flapper age. Um, and she was, she was a trendsetter. And in the same display case, I have a number of original sports cards of tennis players who are well known from um, back in the 20s and 30s. And you can see suddenly they're all adopting the trends that Suzanne Langland set. And I found that fascinating because I had never heard of Suzanne Langland before I started researching this exhibit. And I mean, she was in Europe, but I mean, her fashion sense well, obviously went all the way to America. And even a lot of the um, the movies that you see from the, from that era, women are wearing this fashion that Suzanne pretty much helped implement on a global scale, which was really one of the first times that had ever been done through an athletic figure. Another main portion of the exhibit is on these phenomenal women athletes pre-Title IX who uh, be became educators and kind of promoted women's sports even well after Title IX. And the two ones I'm focusing on here is Maddie English and Mary Pratt, both of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Mary Pratt played, played in the league from 1943 to 1947 and Maddie English from Everett, Massachusetts also played in the league when it first began and played from 1943 to 1950 before she uh, played in a couple other early uh, women's professional leagues after that, after some contract issues and some sketchy behavior um, by the owners and stuff like that from the league she played in. 
But um, what we have here is uh, a couple original drawings of maquettes that were used um, in publications, both of Maddie English. And they are uh, quite fascinating. And these were used in newspapers all over the country. Um, and I have in, in the collection, not on display, but in the collection, a number of actual newspapers where these images were reproduced and used in. Um, and both of these women, I should say, Mary Pratt and Maddie English, dedicated their lives to education after their, after the playing days were done and promoting women in sports. Um, and I, I'll get into the scrapbooks in a bit that they, that we have here now, but um, they're, yeah, they're both from Massachusetts and they both sp spent many, many decades promoting women, the, the importance of women participating in ath athletics. So a frequent speaker at events promoting women in sport, Mary Pratt was also a prominent figure in keeping the history of the All-American Girls League alive. Though the league ended in 1954, she was a regular at annual league meetings that began in 1982. In 1994, she was in the PBS documentary series Baseball, directed by Ken Burns. Prior to this, she was involved as a consultant for the 1992 movie A League of Their Own, which depicted the original 1943 Rockford Peaches that Pratt played for. Maddie English was also heavily involved in the um, All-American Girls reunions and events, and both these women kept documents and photographs of nearly everything they did pertaining to the league, uh, public outreach for the league, trying to preserve its history, also um, increase the awareness of the league's history. And Maddie English, she was thought so highly of that in 2003, the city of Everett named the new school, the Madeline English School, in her honor becoming the first public building in Everett to be named after a prominent woman. And here is a photo of uh, Mary Pratt from 1944 with some of her Kenosha Comet teammates. Um, she played for a different team in the All-American Girls League in 1944. Also here is uh, included uh, her manager, Marty McManus, who was a quite a successful Major League Baseball player before he retired and got into coaching. And he also spent one year on the same team as Mickey Cochran in 1931 for the Detroit Tigers. Mickey Cochran is uh, one of the greatest catchers who ever lived. And he grew right up down the road here in Bridgewater and he's Bridgewater's most famous athlete. He grew up playing baseball right on Wood behind Woodward Hall, which is a part of Bridgewater's campus. And this is one of the most fascinating parts or fascinating artifacts in the exhibit. This is Maddie English's original um, Racine Bell's All-American Girls uniform. Sorry about the different color on each slide, but it is the same uniform, just different lighting from both sides. And I had a hard time finding a mannequin that this could fit on because it's small. The waistline is tiny. Um, this woman was an amazing baseball player, but she was quite petite. And um, I think I found this mannequin on in our theater department about a day before the exhibit was to go up. So I didn't know how I was going to uh, show off this piece, uh, this uniform until uh, right before the exhibit was about to open. This is the uh, one of the display cases that has material for Maddie English and Mary Pratt in it. And um, yeah, original gloves of both players. This is an original Racine Bell's hat that goes with that uniform. Uh, Mary Pratt's original pleach when she played in the league, a uh, page of her scrapbook, um, a number of other things are in this display case. But this is kind of the fun stuff that usually as an archivist, we don't get artifacts like this. Usually it's basically old paper and we don't have a museum on campus. So I get a lot of random artifacts too, all below my clothing, everything like that. So it makes my, my job a little uh, more challenging, but also a little more interesting. And this is another ph phenomenal piece of a Mary Pratt's collection that we have here. She hand carved this cover, which is uh, for her 1943 season, her scrap scrapbook on her 1943 season. And it's signed by all of her teammates from the Rockford Peaches. And uh, it's, it's really incredible. I mean, it's, you can consider it folk art in a way as well, but it's, um, the scrapbook is not in it anymore, but the cover, we keep the cover with the scrapbook. Uh, the scrapbook is uh, kept in uh, plastic sheets and it does not fit in this original case anymore. 
and it's uh, it's just it's really captivating if you see it up close. It's it's pretty amazing. And the first year of the league, it was actually the All American Girls Softball League. That's why you see the different lettering in it. The uh, movie A League of Their Own was not 100% accurate because they were throwing overhand baseball in that movie. The league transitioned through seven different size baseballs until they finally settled on what today we would consider the a normal size baseball. But they started as underhand softball for the first couple of years, and then eventually it turned into overhand baseball league. But the scrapbooks from both these women that we have in the collections here are just incredible. They are filled with hundreds of original photographs of um, players in the league, not only practicing and playing, but also uh, not in uniform, but uh, pursuing leisure activities in, during their downtime between games. And it really brings uh, the, uh, your sense of the league to a different uh, height, really, when you start seeing these, when you start realizing that these players were all very close knit. They are all the best athletes, women athletes at the time all from all over the country. So it's fascinating to see them uh, goofing around in some of these photos um, and things like that. Here's a couple more photos from the scrapbooks, uh, the Racine Bells infield. So that's uh, Maddie English on the right, then her good friend, Sophie Curie's right next to her. And this is an action shot on the left. These are some more photos of the scrapbook, including one from a uh, window display in a store where it states, if you can't read it, take me out to the ball game. Let's see the Racine Bells play ball. And then this is a photo in the dugout, another photo of a, a team in the victory formation, the V after, after uh, the game was over. This is Mary Pratt on the left in the front. And she was very, very short, a left-hander. Um, when I interviewed her in 2018, she was, she must have been about four foot eight. <laughs> and yeah, these are some of the more interesting photos, in my opinion, too. Um, just uh, basic day to day routines of these players. And if you notice the photo on the right, that's another hand carved wooden cover of a scrapbook by Mary Pratt the following year, 1944, when she played for the Kenosha Comets. And that is Mary Pratt on the bottom there of the photo on the left. I'm not sure who she's holding up though. So to turn more to a uh, local level, um, I did want to emphasize Anne O. Coakley um, in this exhibit because we have a lot of great content from her. Anne Coakley was one of many female physical education teachers who received a degree from Boston University's Sargent College during the 1930s and 1940s, who would go on to have successful careers educating and preparing women athletes for future leadership positions in society. While a student at Sargent College, Coakley played lacrosse, tennis, field hockey, and softball before graduating in 1948. In 1951, she was named to the United States lacrosse touring team and spent 10 weeks traveling through Great Britain and Ireland while playing other national and regional teams. She would later go on to coach women's national lacrosse teams that traveled outside the United States. In 1959, Coakley took a position at Bridgewater State teaching physical education, where she would spend the rest of her career until she retired in 1989. She began the women's lacrosse program at Bridgewater in 1960, serving as coach from 1960 to 1978. She remained involved with numerous lacrosse organizations and committees her entire career. She was inducted into Boston University's Athletic Hall of Fame in 1984, Bridgewater State's Athletic Hall of Fame in 1992, and the New Agenda Northeast Women's Hall of Fame in 1993, the New England Lacrosse Hall of Fame in 1998, and both the United States Lacrosse Hall of Fame and New England Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 2000. She's pretty much in every lacrosse hall of fame from the national to the local level in the country. It's, it's just phenomenal. Um, so these are some material on display of uh, Ann Coakley. The image on the right is a uh, official United States lacrosse, women's lacrosse publication, and that's Ann on the cover from uh, 1970 when she uh, coached a national team that toured um, the UK and Ireland. Same program that she played for um, in the early 50s. And this is her lacrosse stick on the left, AOC, her middle name was Oldham. Uh, 
that lacrosse sticks from, <clears throat> from the 1950s. And this is her National Lacrosse Hall of Fame ring. It's very hard to get a good image of that. Um, I didn't have, a good, well, it was kind of hard to get a good image of the glass or the display case. And on the right is her induction uh, program for when she was inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame in 2000. Here is a photo of Anne with Mary Pratt um, on the left. And on the right is a framed, um, well, a number of things in a frame that uh, Anne had collected over the years early in her lacrosse career. Most of the stuff dates from the late 40s to the early to mid 1950s, including a, uh, rule book, a, rule, a small uh, rule book for uh, New England Lacrosse Association. And some of the stuff represents international lacrosse, some of it's national. And I don't quite know what all the letters stand for. But now uh, continuing on the theme of women's athletics at Bridgewater, these are all photographs from uh, early women's athletics on campus here. Uh, all the ones on the left and the frame on the left are from the 1890s and the ones on the right, ones, the top ones from the 1890s and the bottom ones from uh, I think 1914. But um, Bridgewater State has a very long history of women's athletics. We, our, our school was a very early adopter when it came to uh, women's athletics and the, uh, realizing the importance of it under Albert Gardner Boyden, the first Boyden president of the school from 1860 to uh, 1906, I believe. But um, as you can see from the, the label on the photo on the right, girls basketball team from 1898, which includes uh, Alice Bowman on the uh, standing up on the left there, but uh, basketball wasn't invented until 1891 by James Naismith in Spring, right, uh, on the other side of the, uh, the other side of the state in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. So it's kind of impressive just to see how quickly basketball spread throughout the rest of the country after it was invented. And this is our earliest women's basketball team on the left, from about from 1897. And again, you can see the uniforms they're wearing. It's uh, slightly loose fitting dresses. You can see kind of the early stages of bloomers, um, but still rather impractical from what we consider women uh, wearing today for athletics. And I should state too that um, the, uh, the what is today the art building was uh, on campus was built in 1905 as the gymnasium. To, to give you an idea of just how important uh, the Boydens considered athletics, that was the gymnasium. The gymnasium on campus was the first gymnasium ever built specifically for a normal school in the country. This is one of my favorite photographs in our university archives collections. Uh, girls playing basketball from 1898 and Alice Bowman's in this one too. I'm confused by it because as you can see, they're all outside in these loose fitting or not, no, these are real dresses, but um, there's no court, there's no hoop but they're playing basketball. So you can get an idea of the early years of basketball. The rules were still being created um, as to how they were playing. I wish I knew more information about it. If they weren't shooting at a hoop, just exactly how were they playing? That is a mystery to me. <laughs> and um, one of the more important aspects of our school's history for athletic, women's athletics is the um, Hyannis Bridgewater connection. In 1937, the Department of Education established a four year curriculum in the field of health and physical education with a center at the State Teachers College at Hyannis. Thus began the health and physical education professional curriculum that Bridgewater State can trace its history back to. In 1942, Hyannis began its first summer camp program for female health and physical education majors. In 1944, the Hyannis State Teachers College was closed and absorbed by Bridgewater State but the summer program was allowed to continue while the rest of the Department of Health and Physical Education for Girls was moved to Bridgewater. By 1951, the successful summer program at Hyannis would also become part of the Bridgewater State's curriculum, but would, all, but, 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 excuse me, but would retain its name, the Hyannis Summer School, until it was officially ended in the late 1970s. 
1946, the Hyannis Bridgewater Physical Education Alumni Association was formed as a women's professional organization in the field of physical education and health. Bridgewater State's successful history in the training of female physical education educators was greatly influenced by the Hyannis School. Hyannis physical education faculty, such as Mary Jo Moriarty, were brought to Bridgewater along with the program. These are pictures here of uh, Mary Jo from one of her scrapbooks that we have in our Mary Jo Moriarty collection. These are some more photos of uh, one of one of uh, from one of her scrapbooks from her Hyannis days. She uh, began at Hyannis in 1937, and then transitioned to Bridgewater when we took over the program. Moving on to the 1950s, um, I found these in the collection when I was uh, looking for material to use for this exhibit and excuse the bad quality of the photo on the left there of the uniform. Um, you can see myself in the reflection. But um, these are, the image on the left is a gym uniform from the Bridgewater State Teachers College that belonged to Doris J. Goyeche, class of 1951. And on the right is her uh, physical education major, Blazer. Um, if no one's familiar with the uh, evolution of the names of the school, we began in 1840 as the Bridgewater State Normal School. In 1932, we uh, transitioned to the Bridgewater State Teachers College. And then in 1960, we became Bridgewater State College. And then in uh, 2010, that's when we became Bridgewater State University. And uh, you can see on the uniform on the left, there's um, Doris's, her uh, athletic letter with three stars in it and her uh, patch for a physical education major, which is the same patch that's on her uh, blazer. And a more very recent donation, which was donated a couple days before the exhibit opened. So I was, unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, secure display cases to put these in, was from a 1964 graduate, Juliet Johnson. On the left is her, uh, student teaching uniform and on the right is her uh, student, uh, her regular uh, class gym uniform. Um, I wish I had more display cases. I, I, I was limited by just how wide of a scope and how much content I could use for this exhibit based on not only physical location, but just lack of display cases in general. So now to jump back to um, national theme here. We have some great material on display in the exhibit on Babe Diedrichson Zaharias. Mildred Ella Babe Diedrichson Zaharias was named second by Sports Illustrated on the list of the greatest female athletes of all time behind Jackie Joyner Kersey. The Associated Press chose her, chose her six times as female athlete of the year for track and field and for golfing. And in 1950 dubbed her the greatest female athlete of the first half of the century and updated this in 2000 by naming her woman athlete of the 20th century. Babe Diedrichson began dominating the courts in basketball in her teens and excelled in track and field in the 1932 Olympics. She pitched in Major League Baseball exhibitions and for barnstorming teams such as the House of David. And she picked up golf in 1935 and um, just revolutionized the sport. Um, she competed in the Los Angeles Open and other PGA, PGA events, and she was a founding member of the LPGA. She was diagnosed with colon cancer in 1953, resulting in her early death in 1956. Diedrichson married George Zaharias in 1938. Their marriage had problems, and Diedrichson would live uh, with her close friend and fellow golfer, Betty Dodd, for the last six years of her life. So um, she's a fascinating individual just the range of sports that she participated in and dominated in. And um, this is a, also a case where we get into some, um, some of the, uh, I don't wanna say sexual stereotypes of women athlete, athletes, but um, some of it, I had a hard time researching some, some material on Babe Diedrichson because I do have a, a nice photo of her with, uh, her, with Betty Dodd, her fellow golfer. So this is one of these mysteries to me where, um, was it a marriage of convenience or um, was she kind of a, uh, well, I should say, was she a lesbian? I'm not sure. Um, and these are things that are very, very difficult to try to pinpoint when you're doing research because a lot of the stuff was just, 
it might have been assumed, but you're not going to really find it in any documentation anywhere. And if you notice this baseball in the middle, it's signed by Babe Diederichsen, and that's from the House of David. For a month or two in the summer of 1934, she toured with this, lead, with, with this baseball team. It was a barnstorming team. It was um, originally set up for uh, Jewish players, but as it expanded, became a little more popular, they uh, pretty much really tried to get um, well-known players to tour with them to draw an attendance, and they used gimmicks and stuff like that. But Babe Diedrichson would come in and pitch for an inning or two and make a lot of money. And what's unique about this baseball is, I mean, she only played on this barnstorming team for a month or two, if that. So had to have her assigned baseball by her from this team. And it's also signed by a bunch of the other players too. It's quite unique and fascinating. And her signature does stand out the best out of all of them on this baseball because it's quite vibrant and dark. And if you're a collector of the stuff, that's what you're looking for. If it was faded, the value wouldn't be as much and it would be much more difficult to read her signature and put it on display. Stella Walsh is another fascinating um, early woman athletic superstar from the 20s, 30s, and even 40s. Stella Walsh, was, she was born in Poland. Her parents emigrated to the United States when she was two years old. In 1951, she was named the greatest female athlete of the first half of the 20th century by the Helm Athletic Foundation. In 1926, she tied the woman's record of six seconds for the 50 yard dash, and she was prepared to represent the US in the 1928 Olympics. However, she had never become a US citizen, which makes that a little complicated. In 1932, Walsh was offered employment at the Polish consulate if she would represent Poland in the 1932 Olympic Games. She won the 100 meter dash and set the world record at the 32 games. She competed in the 1936 Olympic Games and took gold in the 100 meters and, and came in sixth in a discus throw. Waltz competed both in Poland and the United States in national championships and eventually won 18 Polish titles between 1933 and 46, competing only five times. And she won 40 AAU titles between 1930 and 1951 in multiple events in the United States which for an athlete, a 20 plus span career is really, really amazing, participating at the top level of competition. She became a US citizen in 1947. In 1980, she was tragically shot to death in a parking lot during an attempted robbery. During an autopsy, excuse me. During an, autop, during an autopsy, it was revealed. Sorry, I got someone calling me. During an autopsy, Hope you guys can't hear the phone ringing nonstop. The whole new phone system is terrible here. So um, during an autopsy, it was revealed that she had ambiguous appearing genitalia because Stella Walsh appeared quite uh, masculine and muscular throughout her life. Questions swirled about the legitimacy of her records after her autopsy confirmed that she had a DDS, a difference of sexual development. <laughs> Oh, okay, hopefully I didn't lose him having some computer issues. Um, Walsh was identified as a female at birth and lived as a female her entire life. Um, so controversy around Stella Walsh goes back to the late 1920s. Um, she was a very secretive woman. And um, this is a type of material um, that I was fascinating to come across because we're still seeing very similar information in the news about these same issues today, including the uh, well-known example of um, the mid-distance runner from South Africa who's was been dominating her field, um, but she's tested uh, through the roof for testosterone levels, but it's all natural. So it's very, very um, divisive on this issue and you're still seeing it all over the news now, even on the college and high school levels. Here is a great photo of um, Stella Walsh and Babe Diedrichsen. Um, excuse me if I'm distracted. I'm getting one phone call after another and I can't turn it off. I'll close out this whole meeting at the same time. Um, okay. So 
Another, um, one of the last parts I'm going to talk about is of these two athletes, May Sutton and Althea Gibson. So May Sutton has been largely forgotten and I rarely, I have never seen her name before I was researching this exhibit based on the content that I had. So um, May Sutton, let's see here, um, excuse me. In 1904, at age 16, May Sutton won the US championship singles title. In 1905, she reached greater acclaim, winning the prestigious singles title at Wimbledon, becoming the first American to do so. After finishing runner-up at Wimbledon the following year, in 1907, she won the singles title for a second time. And here's a photo of her on the right from about 1905. And you can see she's wearing the, uh, well, the long dress, skirt, hybrid, um, but still not quite adopting what you see from women wearing in the particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, more of um, the uh, much more loose fitting, free moving clothing style. Also, she's wearing a hat playing tennis, which probably isn't really uh, too practical either. Um, but Alth Althea Gibson is another phenomenal woman ath athlete who's been kind of pushed to the side burner when you, people start talking about the history of a woman's tennis, even though she's very, very important. She's often referred to as the Jackie Robinson of tennis. Um, Gibson was a pioneer for African Americans in the world of tennis. Between 1956 and 1958, Gibson became the first black athlete, man or woman, to win singles championships at the French Open. She won Wimbledon twice, and she won the US Open twice as well. In 1958, she was voted, voted the female athlete of the year by the Associated Press. Um, there's a uh, there's a current documentary airing on her on PBS that I've watched a portion of, and I was shocked to learn because I was when I was putting this exhibit together, I was kind of thinking, why did she stop playing in 1958? But I was shocked to learn that she stopped playing because she couldn't really afford to play anymore because she wasn't making enough money. Um, that's how little these women. I mean, she was a she was a superstar, and that's how little she was getting paid, and she wasn't getting endorsements or anything like that. So she pretty much had to stop playing to get a real job to afford to live. And not until decades later did she actually get some recognition that she should have been getting back in the late 50s. Um, can't help but think if she was a white woman, she would have been a global superstar. But that was not the case, unfortunately. So that is the end of my presentation. There are a couple other part of uh, Display a, a, other couple, a couple of other aspects in the exhibit that I did not put into this presentation, um, just for time reasons. But um, yeah, these, the exhibit runs through March 31st, and then it will be taken right down within a day because the student, the annual student art exhibit, goes up, I believe, the following day. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to have Orson stop sharing his screen, and then you'll see me. Well, we had a little bit of challenge uh, during this presentation uh, between my coughing fit earlier, which I now have cough drops for, and uh, Orson's phone ringing relentlessly, whoever that person is, you know. Matt Spence, retired history faculty member. Oh, yeah. Over because yep. he's having computer problems in Florida. <laughs> oh, gee. Um, so I appreciate all of you uh, sticking with us for that. But what a great presentation, Orson. Um, you did a great job and I absolutely loved it. I actually, despite all of the problems that we just had, I think that this was um, one of the best presentations we've had lately. So thank you. And I'm gonna do something a little different because we're breaking all the rules today. Um, we have a couple of participants on, um, Mary Lou and Emily who are on the Phys Ed Alumni Council and Carrie is on. So if anyone has any questions, why don't you unmute your microphone? Feel You don't have to put your picture up if you don't want um, and feel free to ask them. I don't know if anyone has any questions that they want to ask Orson or add any comments. Um, I know, you know, folks may have some comments, but, uh, you know, Orson, this would oh. go ahead. Thanks, Emily. Orson, I just want to say thank you. This was an amazing presentation. It was very interesting. Um, names that I've learned a little bit over the years about growing up as an athlete in different sports and then a physical educator and it was just really cool to see it all put together and um 
just even ended with Althea at the end. I'm a tennis player. It was just so cool to see all of the, the ladies being recognized for their efforts and, and um, bringing all this wonderful history to light. So thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it is. Um, it's very rare in my field as an archivist where my, uh, well, the world of archives merged with the world of sports. I've always been a sports fanatic. I love sports. I played football, basketball, and track in high school. Um, so it's not too often where I can kind of uh, match up my own personal interest with material I'm getting donated to do an exhibit like this. It was quite enjoyable. <laughs> Great project. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I, it's Mary Lou. Uh, I would just like to add, I saw that uh, document, uh, documentary that they did on Althena. It was incredibly outstanding. Yep. And if anyone has a chance to, it was on PBS. I think it was last month that I saw it. It was absolutely fascinating and um, enlightening in terms of what she went through and how good she was uh, in terms of, of a tennis player and how difficult uh, society made for her in terms of being able to break into uh, tennis. And she uh, really did struggle financially. And through the assistance of a good friend of hers that played doubles with her, uh, they donated money and it helped her um, live the, the remainder of her life in, in some comfort. I believe uh, if you have a chance until, to watch it, uh, I please do. was until the 1990s though, when um, she got a lot of money donated. Yes, um, that's, that's correct. Yeah, she went decades. Yeah little money and she's she's honored in flushing meadows at the site of the u.s open with a, a really large statue in her honor so it's really cool it's definitely a, a spot where many people you know every time i'm there at the open people are in line taking pictures of the statue and so it's great to see that she's you know now getting the recognition she deserved she was tremendous at tennis for sure really cool she was also an outstanding golfer, which he took up later. Yeah. And that reminds me, um, I, I played at Babe Diedrichson's um, golf course in Florida recently, a few months ago. And it was really cool to see this course that, you know, is all dedicated to her um, down here as well. So some really great names in the, in the presentation. So on the theme of women's golf, that's one thing I found fascinating too, is I, um, cause I, I got a number of collections representing, um, different players from the all American girls league from the forties and fifties. And so many of these women and a number of the women I talked about too, they just were phenomenal athletes and played multiple, multiple sports, but a number of the, uh, collections I have from the women in the all American girls league after they they were done playing baseball, they, um, really got into golf and um i'm freaking the names off the top of my head but a couple of them were other like original lpga members who helped get that whole uh aspect of golf created in the first place um i forget if marge rousseau was one of them but um joan winters she was one of maddie english's long standing teammates for the racine bells she uh, became one of these early pioneers in women's golf too after she was done playing baseball um, and a couple other of them. It's, it's fascinating to start connecting all these things through multiple sports from these women. Yeah, I Hi, agree. Folks. Could I ask a question? <laughs> yes. Hi, how are you? I've enjoyed this very much. I'm an alumni of Bridgewater and um, I miss it. I don't live in the area, but I, I wondered, and I may have missed it, who was the most noted female athlete of the first half of the 20th century at Bridgewater. Do we, do we know that? So these questions, types of questions are very difficult for me to um, mm. really answer. Cause um, every now and again, I get asked by the athletic department who was our first African-American athlete. <sighs> yeah. So it, it depends on how you wanna define I guess an athlete though. So uh, Sarah only, she was an African-American student here from 1908 to 1912. And she played, I guess what we would consider now intramural athletics, but women didn't have leagues. And at the time, not even the men here really had real leagues they, they played in. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's, it's hard to pinpoint 
the first athlete when before Title IX, the, the league structures didn't exist like they do today. Um, and also, do we have a kind of a, a, a gray period in terms of our archival collection from the 1930s to the late 1950s? Um, so even figuring out our first male African-American athlete, um, I don't have any documentation that specifically states this is the first person. Um, right. So I can't really prove it. I mean, I'm and even going through photos. How far back do yearbooks go? 1899. 1899, mm -hmm. okay. They, they don't all have uh, port, uh, senior portraits in them though, especially oh, the okay. early years. And mm -hmm. I don't wanna assume every student in the class would have had their photo in the yearbook further back you go, that's usually much more common to, for students to, to be uh, represented in the yearbooks. But um, I mean, I've gone through everything I could think of, but even if I find um, an African-American student from like the 19, mid 1930s, I can't for certain know that that would, would have been potentially the first athlete represented by African-Americans. Um, and I, I'm hesitant to give someone that distinction when I can't really prove it. Hmm. It is something Thank that you. More research. <laughs> I think, Thank you um, for that. You know, just as a side note, you know, um, uh, uh, both Emily and Mary Lou and Carrie, I don't know what your background was um, as a student, but it's nice to meet you. And I don't know where you're located, but I'm glad that you were able to join Thank us you. today uh, virtually. Um, but, you know, Emily and Mary Lou are highly involved with the Phys Ed Alumni Council, which was the highest to Bridgewater, you know, alumni, what do we call it, like Alumni Association. Um, so they're both members of that group. And it was really interesting, obviously, to see them involved also and hear about that. But this is also the 85th uh, anniversary of our Phys Ed program um, this year. And wow. So, um, you know, we are going to be doing some things to celebrate that in the fall. And I feel like some of this stuff might be cool to put on display, you know, in that sense. So just something cool to think about, right? Emily and Mary Lou, like this was great information. I, I would agree. This, this has been very, very informative and, yeah. and I really enjoyed it. And I will, as an aside for Alexis and for uh, Emily, say that I spoke with Body Stevens today and she will be speaking at the Mayford Convention. Excellent. Great. Awesome. Yeah. So this is great. So um, I let me do the rest of my little wrap up if no one has any other questions. Does anyone have any other questions? No, just then, thanks again. This was really, this is really cool. And you know, I teared up for some of it because I get we're so passionate about our, our sports and our physical education. So it's really nice to see um, you know, women recognize. I remember being, you know, much younger as a little girl and hearing Mary Pratt's name and knowing she's from Massachusetts and just growing up in a sports family. So you brought some good memories and some good, some good thoughts. I definitely am the person I am today because of a lot of these women. So I'm thankful for the presentation and thanks for doing it. It was really cool. Glad you liked it. Thank awesome. you. Thank you guys for being a part. And Carrie, I hope I can get to know you a little better in the future. Sure. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know um, that uh, we have another alumni coming up um, that will be in May, May 11th, actually. And um, May is Brain Awareness Month. And so on Wednesday, May 11th, um, at 1230, we're going to have Dr. Sandra Niergardner, a professor of psychology at Bridgewater State University, present on Alzheimer's disease, the effects of symptoms, brain pathology, and cognitive and visual de deficits on everyday functioning. So um, that will be happening. And I think, you know, most people saw um, that we've launched our social bear campaign. So if anyone has any photos that they ever want to share with us, um, that would be great. You can um, look out for an article on that in our newsletter, which should be coming out in the next day or so. And as always, if anyone has any suggestions for future alumni topics or presenters or any feedback that you would like to share regarding the alumni 
uh, alumni series, feel free to email us at alumni at bridgew.edu. And be, on behalf of the entire office, I thank you guys for spending your Wednesday with us. Thank you again to Orson. Thank you to everyone um, who's here. And I'm glad we got to have a little discussion at the end and have a great rest of your day.